thank you for uh, coming and being here. We've had a full Git workshop today. But I wanted to give something um, different in the open talk. It's not a repetition of what we had in the workshop today. It's, um, it's actually something quite different. Because we talked about using Git and GitHub, switching to them, using them as our new version control system. But many times it's not so simple. You can't just tomorrow, no matter how excited you are, tell your company, we're switching everything over. Um, usually the answer to that is not switching to Git. You get fired instead of using tomorrow and taking down this version. So there's actually some really good story behind how you can progressively migrate. But it's not a story that's covered very much because people either use Subversion or they use Git, but not many people talk about the two because you, you change. You don't talk about a bridge. I'll tell you who's using the bridge and how to use it and what you can set up on your own in ways that you can kind of make that a slow migration over the time. So in talking about this, um, I want to give plenty of opportunity that it's not just today's talk. Um, you can write me afterwards or you can come to office hours, which I'll or at the end and ask more questions beyond what we have. But I want this to be very interactive. So this is not me standing here giving some sort of presentation. I want you to, at any time that you have a question about how something works or whether it works or whether you can use it, just interrupt me and ask. And I will be very happy. So why am I here? I only want to take 15 seconds because you didn't come to care about me at all. You want to hear about the tool. But the only reason I'm giving this talk is I work for GitHub. I've been talking to Git for about five years. Um, I've written books and videos for O'Reilly on the topic, so it's something that's really important. That's the main thing you should care about. Git is extremely important. And we're focused on one very small piece of this conversion. This small piece is the subversion to Git direction. And what I mean specific about this, there's actually this really interesting book that I read last year that I think is quite relevant. It talks about the fact that people will naturally resist changing stuff simply because it's easier to just stay where you are with your house, your car, your whatever. It's easier, even if it's not so great of a place, just to stay where you are. You are. So what I'm going to try to do is give you some really easy, small, simple steps to be able to go from subversion to Git, not all at once, not tomorrow, not next weekend, but maybe over even the course of the year. And along the way, I'm going to tell you why you would even want to switch. Because it's one thing to say A and B, but maybe the two grass, two yards at the same. Maybe the two apartments are about the same length. So why would you want to go from one to the other? Well, subversion is a very good conversion control system. You might be surprised that given I work for GitHub and I work with Git all the time that I would say anything nice about it. But I actually have not had any bad experiences really with most of my existing version control systems. The only one that I feel like has taken me out to the back of the yard and beat me with a sap is ClearCase. I feel so abused by that. But other than that, I've had a good experience with everything else. So even more so, I'm making my job really hard to if this is working fine for you, then why do you even want to switch it? So I'll give you three big reasons and a couple of demonstrations in the notes. Some, the people in the workshop will have already seen for the demos, but the ideas in the discussion is flavor slightly differently. I'll give you something that is getting a lot of respect and is really important. I have no affiliation with ThoughtWorks, but they produce this PDF that's having a lot of influence on a lot of businesses because they've decided for something that they used to produce and only keep in this consultancy. They thought, why? I have a lot of debates with these people about this, and I said, you should share this. You should take whatever you produce for this radio and the documentation of it, and you should just make it available to everybody. So they did. A couple of years ago, they started publishing this thing called the Technology Radio. And you could go, yeah, yeah, one of their top 10 gardener list, forester list, whatever, I don't care what they have to say. But what's useful behind this, and differs than most of the business reports, is that they give you a sense of where something's going. Rather than, you should use this, or stop using this, they give you a sense of how, where it's heading, and where it is on the radar. Is it heading in, or is it heading out? And what are its pieces that are nearby? And even more importantly, they give you a reason behind this, which I think is very different than the usual analyst recommendations. 
So when this came on the board of being a recommendation over here with ours for Git and for GitHub specifically, we saw a lot of people look into it and just kind of brush their hand and say, yeah, but you know what? I'm in a big company. I'm a 100-person consultancy. We can't just switch things overnight. So the idea for this talk is talking about how can you slowly, progressively, and step-by-step -step migrate and what you'll see on the other side of the conversion. The first thing is that built into the core of Git, if you install Git on Windows, Mac, or Linux, you get this tool, and it is severely underutilized. This is not a one-time conversion tool. This is a round-trip supporting tool that allows you locally to get some of the benefits of Git, but to still send your changes back to subversion as the central repository. This literally means that if you want to be devious of it, you can use this tool and Git with absolutely no permission from your superiors or your managers because the backend stays exactly the same. Your commits look exactly the same. Your commit messages still have revision numbers. And all you're getting is the extra benefit of Git on your local box. Now, I would like to make this as hands-on as possible, which means that as soon as I tell you this about it, I simply do this at the command line and we talk about how this actually works. Nothing beats that illustration. So what I have up on your screen is a terminal window. This is where I'm going to run these changes. And I'm going to position it down just a little bit on the screen so we don't get too much of the margins. And I'm in a scratch directory. And I have at my disposal a subversion repository that is ready and ripe for the Chrome. I'm going to pop this into that window, and what I have there is get SVN clone, standard layout, and then the address of my subversion repository. Now, when I run this command, you notice it's a git command, and the subcommand is subversion. And it will read this revision number by revision number by revision number, producing a local git repository that is equivalent to all of the collective history of the remote security repository. Now this can take a fair bit of time. I'm not selling anything today. This is something I'm passionate about, but there's no sales pitch. So that means that I get to say the things that are not quite as perfect as they should. Subversion does not have a great network protocol within the one six and four year versions for exporting the whole repo. So the best that we can do is walk one revision number at a time. Not exactly the most efficient way, but it's accurate and it works. It's just slow. This over the wire has walked through every revision number and every branch and created here in my local directory a repository that is this unfunnel git. This is the git repo that is equivalent to this version. And I can even ask for git SVN info and it still has remembered where this came from. So there's Git knowledge and there's subversion knowledge, both combined into one repository. If I look back at the history of, say, the last two commits, you'll see that it even maintains the subversion metadata in the commit messages themselves. So you have a new Git repo, but you still have connectivity and knowledge of where it really came from. What revision number, what branch, you can tie all of that information down. The Git hashes are generated when, when, you, when you do the import? Correct, because they are a function of the file content and the relationship with the previous commit and the commit message. So absolutely yes, but with all three things calculated. So having done that, I can see that there's a bit of history for me. But further, I can actually show you that it has honest goodness brought over the trunk in the feature ranges and the tags as well. This is a full fidelity repository copy such that I'm not on the Wi Fi. Unplugged, I can still look at any of those branches and I can get checkout if I want to observe any of them. Remotes, feature branch one, and I can look at the history of what's been happening on the feature range. Feature range 
in Japan. There's no connection at all. <coughs> this is a full <coughs> copy of the repository locally. But your next question would be, okay, so I can read only take it with me on the plane, but how do I give work back to the repository? So that actually is what makes it um, really almost more fun, I would say. I'm going to check out the master branch in this case. And I'm going to look at the files that I have over here. I'm going to make one small change to the file. Uh, open up the line. I'm going to add it. Staging the change, and I'm ready to commit. I'm going to commit the change. Looks like it's primarily been me. 
So these are the kind of things that you can do investigatively that are simply not possible with subversion. But I haven't given up any of the subversion backhand. I haven't asked my administrator to change anything. And yet I'm getting all of these benefits locally by having increased what I claim, increased the fidelity of the repository on the community into the from subversion on the backhand. I can also do really neat <coughs> visualizations. <coughs> this, being able to view all the history, see what's been happening, see if new branches have been spun off to the side, and again, <coughs> local level performance, local performance for doing these kind of operations. So that gives you a really good first sense of being able to use this. I think, well, thank you very much for the end of the talk, right? Hardly. You can do even better. Because Git has much higher fidelity metadata. Git has author and code as separate fields. Git has the ability to store not only the name, but the email address. So when you're converting, where would you get this extra information? Or when I converted the Groovy project, our good friend, of course, on the screen, Andres, <laughs> but when we did this conversion, we created a little mapping file like this. It gives you usernames to name mappings. And when you do the Git SVM that you just saw me run through, it'll read this author's file from the same directory, this author's mapping file that looks like this. So there's plenty of samples, but it's a very simple format. Username equals string like you from the Git side. Now, when we are doing this migration, I want to also point out some of the things that are kind of funny. The people who always want to hate on a tool use this as their reason for complaining about and writing about Maybe. this conversion tool. But I want to address it head on. Subversion, if you really think about it, doesn't have tags. Okay? What it has is a subdirectory that you're supposed to pretend are tags that are actually branches that you're not supposed to change. And the tool kind of helps you not change them, but they are still branches. So when you use this git SVN tool, the biggest complaint is that the subversion tags become git branches. And to that, I say, don't be <laughs> You will never win, just let them have this point and move on quietly. Or, use this. This is a little wrapper that sits right on top of the Git SVN that you saw. There's very little code in this, it's very small, it sits on the top, and what it does is it does as a final step a conversion of the subversion tag branches to real Git tags. This little command line tool is available up at this repository, and its use case is as simple as this. I'll make sure all these slides and links, so they don't have to copiously take notes, are in Jose's hands, and he'll send these out, so I'll make these easily available. They're already up in the speaker deck, so I'll put up the URL. But this is all you'd have to do. So, let's try that. What would this look like? Well, I'm going to need to make a containing directory. There's a slightly different behavior here. So I'm going to call this SVN to get try2, and I'm going to see into that. And then I'm going to use that SVN git command with a whole lot less options than I used on the SVN um, git conversion tool. Remember, this is just a little wrapper on the top of the other tool that we are in here. Now, it's a whole lot less verbose in terms of the output. You can turn on a verbose flag and have it spit it out. But the idea is basically just press the button strip it down to the easiest thing, give me a subversion repo URL, have some patience for a couple of minutes, or if the repo is huge, hours, it could be. And at the outset of this, you have, boom, a converted repository. ls minus al, here's my dot, dot get directory, show me my branches, and show me my get tags. Everything converted to the right place if you want to conversion on these things. Yes, that really was a subversion tag. 
and yes, it's not properly just a nice little polish on top of the This is still um, a, a full fledged, we do this, to show you something, Git repository. But it actually strips out, this is a reason to be careful with this, it strips out the SVN information because the goal of this one is to provide a full fidelity conversion at which you close the door on subversion and move on with it. That's its purpose. The other underlying tool is what you want to use if you intend to do non trip spec. This one is your I'm going to convert everything and close it the subversion server. Now, these pieces that we've seen so far are really just the two beginning kind of building blocks to all of this. And what's fascinating is that you can take any of these repositories and then mirror them up on GitHub to get contributions over there. So again, even if this was open source, even if this was closed source, you could take and shove your code up to GitHub simultaneously. In fact, you could even just push one little slice if you wanted to, such as maybe just the master branch. And it's this interesting idea that I want to take and use a little diagram to go over just a second. We've used this all day long. I'm going to put this on the other screen and I'm going to start off with Slate. And with our subversion repo, maybe we had a trunk branch, feature branch off to the side, some maintenance branch off of one of these others, all this craziness. But with these conversions, we can be as specific as choosing one of these branches, the master branch maybe, or a feature branch, or this fix branch off to the side, and just publish that piece. In other words, converting to Git actually gives you more options of what you want to share with some colleagues via Git rather than less. You can be very specific, exchange some code, we can get some contributions back to the end, and then I can fold them back over to Subversion. In fact, if I even change my username, it will preserve it. Let me take you to the command line again to make some sense of this. I'm going to go over to our unfuddle git repository. And in a git-like fashion here on the master branch, I am going to git config and I'm going to do user.name other person. And so, and I'm going to make a whole series of commits that generate some native changes for five sample txt files. I'll show you that that history is indeed this other person. And I'll subsequently then go back and make one more configuration to send it back as myself. So this is just a nice little way to simulate there's two people actually working with in a timely fashion. And I'll generate a couple more changes to the same files. Now, if I take and get push these back to GitHub, it'll preserve the full fidelity of the user. And if I take and get SVN decommit, it will downsample these to the person that is actually doing the push. So these activities will both be written as me. So I want to point out, as I said, some cautions. When you have Git, you suddenly have all this extra metadata. My caution here is that when you're converting back to subversion, just as I'm doing here, to squeeze everything back down into what Subversion will let you record. Since Subversion is network authenticating the username at the time that I do the commit with the Subversion repository, these are, and you can call it a shortcut, indeed going to show up as me having the reward. But I just want to make you aware of this so that tomorrow you don't curse my name and switch everything over. But to me, it's not that big of a deal because I have most of the individuals set up doing this push, this decommit themselves, so it still shows up as the person doing the work. I'm rarely taking in contributions from multiple people and then me shoving it to the subversion repository. But it still handles it well. I just want to be, I want you to be aware of that downside. Further, if I take and start a branch over in Git, I want to show you one other field that's kind of lost that you'll think about. 
I'm going to start a branch over here on the side that I'm going to call feature four. And I'm going to go back and make myself um, other person here. And having done that configuration, I'll generate some random changes just to sample TXTs over here. And over here on the feature branch, we now have two changes that I might be interested in. Now, if I show you the contents, git, log, format, equals raw, for this most recent commit, you'll see that the author and the committer are other person. But git has this concept of being able to track those fields independently, which means that when I take and pull one of these pieces back over to the master branch, like so, and then show you what is preserved over here. Oh, come on. A small mistake. Change myself back to Matthew. When I cherry pick in this change like this, I will get log minus one that equals raw show you that it has two distinct fields. And you can get really, really attracted to the fact that you can track in Git who is the author, but then who is the committer. You can just track of these things sensibly separately. But I ask you to think once again that when you're converting this into subversion, in a way, like a music file, you're downsampling, and it does not have a place to store both of those fields. So we'll take ownership of whoever did the git SVN decommit. This bit of metadata that you become very attracted to is lost on the push methods. So I took both an equally balanced positive and negative turn to this. And I'll next want to tell you what we can do about actually what? Serving SVN without any effort? Well, this has been in GitHub for quite a long time. And it's almost bizarre. I go over to, to a GitHub repository, <coughs> github.com forward slash Matthew McCullough, hello get world, looks good as anything. I'll pull up this repo. I'll look over here at the HTTP address. I'll copy it to my book. This is a Git serving site. What in the world does this have to do with SVN? Let me go to the command line. Let me take and step out of this repo. And let me SVN check out that repo's trunk. Look what command I'm about to run. Not a get one, a subversion of the trunk range. This is funny. <laughs> Hey, you've been spoiled with the speed of Git. Don't be mad at me. <laughs> and here in Trump is an honest to goodness SVN status, SVN info, subversion repository from a Git repo at GitHub. Maybe, and I have a reason for being a little sour for that last five or seven minutes. Maybe you should turn everything upside down. Maybe you should convert your repo to Git, push it up to some place like GitHub, and then let the people who want to be Luddites and stay behind, let them keep using their old tools, but you'll have the fidelity of all of the things that can be preserved in Git. They can turn it upside down, sometimes They can access specific branches, and they can SVN CI, checking into this. But I doubt you believe me just here. So what if I take and make a modification to Twitter? To the end of this test. Right and quit. SVN CI. And in this case, I actually don't have the credentials on this repo, which is actually a useful example. 
But this tried to do a real commit to this repository and push that change back. Um, I turned myself off so we get a few failures here again on the SVN side. But it's neat to see that you really can. That would be the recipe if I want to write to myself the access. That'd be the recipe just to commit that back into the subversion. So, really, the whole idea is which will be the master, which will be the dominant piece, and which will be the conversion piece, if you will. Are you going to let the back end or the server be the conversion utility, as with GitHub, or are you going to let the front end be the conversion utility with the git SVN command? Now, all of this stuff that's been linked together actually spawns one other bit of the conversation today that I think is really useful to take away when we talk about Git and subversion. Because I've talked about what to type and how to convert it and where you can save the commits, but what I haven't mentioned is this data structure that I keep referring to in the back and why it's such a big deal for Git use. Git, on the back, has a directed asynchronous graph of changes. This relates to a project that I'm coming up to in just a minute that uh, is very important so we can spend a lot of time in the subversion and Git world with. Git, unlike most version control systems, does not store delta changes between the files as they're committed. Now this seems like a ridiculous oversight, like they're missing a really important feature. And it seems like without delta storage storing the changes, this is going to be huge and inefficient. It's just going to be enormous for the repository. But it turns out to be frequently one-fifth or maybe even one-tenth of the size. But that seems like opposing things. I don't see how both can be true at the same time. Why would Git not even implement this? The main reason is because if you're going to start doing these investigative actions, the searching and the logging that I've been doing, you need a ridiculously fast ability to just scroll back through the changes. And deltas are actually a very antagonistic effect to the lab because you have to reconstruct the old states of the repository. So what we're going to do instead with Git is something crazy. At every time that we make a commit, we are going to store everything. Every file, every directory, worse ever. Can you believe that we're going to keep everything every time you make a small commit? Well, clearly there have to be a few tweaks to this. And the tweaks all derive from the fact that we've optimized a little bit too early. If you could have a version control system in which you could care less about how much disk space it took, wouldn't it be useful if every revision had every setup, every file, and every directory just sitting there in a version form. In fact, for those of you who own Macs, may actually even recognize this pattern. If you looked at your time machine back, it looks like a series of date stamped folders that look like they have an entire copy of your hard drive. But that's not possible in an external. You can have 70 copies of your internal hard drive. I doubt it would fit. So what they do is a couple of shortcuts. Between versions, it looks like this file is here, but it's really just a hard link back to the last time it changed. It looks like this file is here, but it's really just a hard link back to the last time it changed. So we get the appearance that all the files are in every version of the repository, but we don't actually pay the price as if they were actually there. Then, we use the thing that seems to be the golden hammer when you need a golden screwdriver, which is you turn compression on it, just like this magic, like no sequel. It's also supposed to be all your apps work, web scan. But this turns out to be not that much savings. Compressing individual objects is only a modest savings. What would really be awesome is if you could disrespect whatever directory or file name, or any locality of the files, and dump them all in a big bucket and compress them. Because that means that this file that was very similar to this file, that was somewhat similar to this file and very similar to this file, would then have an opportunity with a good compression algorithm 
to have a huge disk savings. You're not worried about how it compares to its neighbor. You're allowing for savings for it to be compared to anything else, anywhere in the repo. A file with a slightly different name and most of the same characters yields a 90% compression ratio, even though it's in a separate directory with a separate file name. Because all of these objects are piled in the moving bucket and compressed. This is the kind of savings I chose this program, this particular one specifically, because this is one that I helped convert last year towards the end of the summer. And the reason I chose this is you should be in disbelief about some of these numbers, but this is open source. You can go to um, Codehouse and verify the subversion repo. You can go to GitHub and you can verify the code. So you, you need to have zero trust in the CPU. You can go check those out for yourself before you have It almost doesn't seem possible, even, even that I've been in this five years, it is difficult sometimes for me to convince myself that the same history can fit in that little of space with just these techniques that I've shown you. It seems like at least with the fact that we gave up deltas, it should grow a little, not shrink by one down to one tenth of the size of the source. So this concept of the graph and how it's stored actually leads us to one more important idea that either people love or they hate. And it was part of our discussion today. Why can't I have a revision of a simple R1, R2, R3 and get why do I have to have these complex, crazy, 40 hex character, fingerprinty, awful looking? Can you imagine reading this to your colleague? Why? Because there is no database that has an auto encoding column. There's no place in a distributed version control system to phone and ask for the next revision number and then get it back. You might not have a network, you might not have any connection to anything. You're maybe working at the same time as one of your colleagues. So we need something that can be calculated independently based on the contents of the file. SHA-1 is a hash and digest function that produces 160 bits of output. It takes the contents of all individually the files that you are committing to the repository and it produces a 40 hex character hash for each of those. It does it for blobs, Images, text, JavaScript, HTML, Java, Objective-C, your trees, directories, your commits, the action when you're actually seeing the checkpoint in time, and it does it for tags. And it looks something like a Merkle tree of hashes, but we're starting from the right-hand side, going to the left. We hash the contents, and we have a fingerprint. We take the fingerprint, and we store it next to its file name. So here's some contents. I want you to save this to disk. It's fine. We list all of those in a directory, just like your file system, and that produces a unique fingerprint for the directory, which can then be nested in another directory. Normal subdirectory, source, menu, Java, resources, build, and output directories, all culminating in one hash at the top that points to the tree, stores all of the commit message as an important artifact of the commit history and produces a hash at the top, which as a result means, as people learn in the class today, that a single bit error anywhere in history can be detected at any point in time. Guaranteed single bit level integrity for every commit from the beginning of the repository to the current time. You can guarantee there's no bit rot, there's no malicious intent, there's been no uh, commits that actually people will try to stuff back in. And in fact, all of this relationship is established in the next time by the fact that one commit, two commits, three commits are chained together in a linked list like fashion. The parent is what actually puts to the very last commit. And this fragility of the linked list structure is actually what provides the integrity of the I'll show you in a very kind of fun moment 
that I can take it back uh, to a repository. I got a little simple one that I can clone. Uh, clone the HP of the world, the first copy of this. Network. Here we go. I'm going to this repo. I'm going to say, get it, show me your recent history. Everything looks all happy and beautiful. Um, I'm going to see the best one path. We're going to take them, go into the git.in directory. I'm going to act as if I were damaging this repository. And I'm going to do that after I get the And I'm going to intentionally damage the repository. I'm going to insert one character at the beginning of the file. I'm going to write the file anyway. And I'm going to. I'm now going to ask Git log, how are you doing? And immediately detects that there is corruption. Now, certainly that was a crafted example. I wouldn't say anything other. But in practice, you can get exactly the same thing for disks that we run for a bad network that transmission zip on these repositories. And every, every, every place, there is the ability for a CRC check to make sure it's a this is a level of guarantee. It's not some tool built on top of Git. What is Git? You can't have this data structure without, if this breaks, if this content changes, that doesn't connect anymore. And so, effectively, you're toast. You've broken your name and it's detected. And on the flip side, stuff like branches that are really expensive and hard to work with, well, they become as simple as just a reference to one of these whatever cache forms. You would normally, in something like Subversion, let's uh, take one of our other public projects over here, and, and you'd start a new branch by something like project one, git branch uh, my new branch like that, and in git, you want to use the phrase uh, check out to toggle over this way. Like so. But that could be a relatively expensive operation and populate that branch to the people that you want to see it. Yet. On the other hand, with Git, the reason that this is so fast, even in a repository that contains thousands and thousands of files, is because all this actually is is a pointer to a hash in the graph. If I look at this very last commit, 0, 6, 7, 1, 3, 4, etc. I can take and edit a file in the .git directory. Heads. Put in the hash in a plain text file. And ask git to show branch to show me the list of local branches. And there, is a first class branch that I have just ridiculously created in the text. Now you think to yourself, well that that's not a first class branch. I bet you can't really, I bet you can't really use it. Try to Then I can make new commits to All of this became possible by having really excellent insurance data structures behind this. Creating a branch is a fixed time operation. Committing files is nearly a fixed time operation for what happens in the background. Transmitting these changes over the network becomes ridiculously easy as well. I'll make another directory that I'll call thousands two. I'll even see into that subdirectory. I'll generate a insane number of files. I'll show you that they're here. I'll add them to version control. I'll commit them and I'll push that change
up to GitHub. And I'll send that branch changes up over to GitHub. Done. That transmitted right there in that two or three seconds, 5,000 brand new files. And what I want to prove by this is not some sort of race car stunt or speed demon like thing, but to show you that when the right data structure is chosen, all of these things that you would have labeled as complex, hard, requiring lots of code, a database, something crazy, a lot of time, some sort of non-linear growth to the time to make these work, are not true, not true, not true, not true, and not true because of the proper architecture that sits behind this. Fast, 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 in every single one of these cases. All because of these data structures that I've just showed. The same thing applies for tags, the same thing applies for branches, and the same thing applies day in and day out. You almost forget about how lightweight version control can actually be. All of this work that I've been doing has focused around making commits locally. Then, at the very end, I transmitted some changes. And all of these activities have actually been tracking content at the content level. And all of these things provide a fantastically simpler merge experience. Those two kind of feel like they should be backed up by some simple examples, and then we'll stay around for just a little bit more discussion. But that'll be the crux of what I wanted to show you. The bridge, the two directions you can go with it, and then why you'd even be interested to get in the first place as a destination. These last two little pieces, the content tracking and the merges, have a really fun and easy way me to prove this to you. I'm going to shrink the font size just a bit uh, for this next piece of the demo. And there's a reason why I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, drop out of my Tmux for just a second. Let's my Tmux back up. And I'm going to here get my other window thing. Okay. Excellent. I am now going to switch over to the actual Git repository. And I'm going to show you this file that I'm showing the students today, rereadree.c. This is a listing of a source file in the Git project itself. Over here, in lines 15 through 22, are a block of code that it looks like Stefan Bayer did in July 9th of 2008. That's just a file listing with some C code right inside. But you know what? That's actually not what happened. He was tasked with moving the code from another file into this file. And in fact, the code that he moved was written by two other people in the original file. But that's long since lost. I mean, how would you know where it was originally written? If you were, if you were set in front of the source code today and no one would talk to you, how would you even know where it was originally written? You'd have no idea. Except, I'm going to turn on a flag that tells it to do content detection. And those same lines, the same code, now have radically different information in front and radically different mistakes of whom and very different dates. This followed the code back to where it was originally written. Not where it was cut and pasted to, but where it was originally authored. Different file, different people, different dates, in several different blocks, three different times. You can now ask two very separate and very intelligent questions. Stefan, why did you move the code into rereadree.c? Or you can ask Johannes or Junio why they wrote the code the way they wrote it. 
separate questions, each providing very different answers. And you know exactly who you go to in both of those cases. This is what content level tracking actually means. And I will use that as a springboard to say that same content level tracking allows me to give you an awesome little example like this. I'm going to start a brand new Git repository, just so we've got a nice clean slate. And I'm going to go into this project too, and I'm going to start writing some code. My assignment is to write it as quickly as possible, so I'm going to put this first.html file in the root of the project itself. In fact, I want to bail back out of that and open it up. Like this. And in here, um, I would like to just kind of write a little basic uh, file. Good JavaScript, HTML, good enough. And I'm going to return myself back to my command prompt. And I'm going to get add this to version control and commit it and call it the first command. Nothing interesting. But now, something interesting happens. Two people, me with hat one and me with hat two, are given an assignment to do a bug fix and some feature work. I'm going to start a branch off to the side that I'm going to call feature one. Now, that branch is now started, and from a drawing perspective, what we have over here is this. Commits, the master branch, and the feature branch going in opposite directions. Given that, we are going to go back to the command and we're going to do a bug fix. We are going to then this feature one, this uh, first.html file. And somewhere up here, I'm going to, as all good, Good enough. Two good fixes. I've now made bug fix. I am going to put on hat number two and toggle over to the feature range. On the feature range, the design document is off. It says, I want you to make a directory called uh, source files. I want you to move the first.html file into there. I want you in the source files directory to rename the first.html to uh, uno.html instead. Crazy. I then want you to open up that file and make a, a feature addition to it. So, well, let's get to it. New name. Here in our editor. Scroll our way on down. What is our feature that we're supposed to do? Uh, our feature. Let's change that. And now, I'm going to step back a directory and show you what Git has to say about this. What a mess. Git thinks that we have a brand new file, it's the directory, and one that disappeared, which it's right. I mean, that's, that's what happened. But here is where that same similarity index, that blame, that content tracking that you just saw, here's where it comes into play here. Git has, after the fact, with no help, detected that that file moved into the subdirectory. But it had content changes too. Don't forget, I changed the content of it and gave it a new name, and it was able to detect that. I did it without any help from a GUI or a daemon or a background process. Nothing, 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 nothing. And let's make this awful. This is feature work. And applause, forget it, right, right, but you know, the worst is yet to come. Because you're back on the master branch, the one that you release to customers. There's been bug fixes, remember? Bug fix from a minute ago. And the bug fix was in that old file name, first.html, the root of the project. This is going to be a nightmare. Except it's not. It automatically renamed the file to the way that the feature range had changed it. But it preserved. The bug fix. 
the two of them at the top. While still in the middle, preserving the feature mark as well. And people have a very difficult time who are passionate about Git at work articulating why it is that it seems it works better. They, they say that, but I'd like there to be more science behind it. And I think what I've had the opportunity to do with that demo is to take something you may have already heard and to give you a from the ground up representation of what you might experience in terms of a much easier way of merging in feature changes to things that have been done as bug fixes. And this is one of the supporting reasons why people who talk about Git as a much easier way to work find themselves interacting with it less because it does more for them rather than putting more on them to actually have to do more for them. That was two fun ways to kind of end the demonstration. But I have one more since our, my watch says we have the time for five more minutes. I gave this demonstration at the end of the workshop, but to many of you, it will be for I'm going to go over to a repository. <coughs> and I'm going to go over to one that has effectively a problem. I'm going to show you the history of this repo. And you'll see that there is some added scripts, ignore file, fixed merge conflict, uh, merge in my feature branch, blah, blah, blah. OK. So I am going to do a search for where the code started failing. MVN test, MVN being my build tool, will run our unit test suite. And it's compiling. And unfortunately, we have failed our tests. Now I want to know where this regression happened. So I am going to use the bicep tool to help make that possible. I'm going to start in bisect mode. And I'm going to, in bisect mode, tell it where it's bad. Currently, right where I am. I'm going to tell it where it last worked successfully. Um, 11 commits ago, I think. Now, I am going to tell Bisect to run my automated test suite over everything between those two points. Drawing this is usually quite helpful. Commits and our good and bad points. Bad. Good, back here. And our robotic job, the tool, is to have it keep moving these in until it identifies one commit that must be called. That's all there is to it. It will search and squeeze in both sides of this until it finds the one that failed. How, in fact, um, I wrapped them in a couple quotes. The globalization is This is So there is actually the run for the, uh, where it actually produced the test results. And what that did, the picture serves it much better, is just squeezed in both sides of those, until it found the commit, this one, that caused it to change from successful to failing. <coughs> now, I'm going to start this process over and add one other visualization to it. It's very short. I'll reset them, and I will get K. Uh, This is, this is the history. This is what's been going on just in the graph before. So we're going to search between these, and I can even show you how we squeeze those two lines together. Okay. Run our 
tests. Have it squeezing both of the sides. And get ISECT. Visualize. And here is the same picture. Squeeze it out to just two minutes. Just keep moving in the sides. So you'll find a commit that used to work, and immediately after the commit, the test will help succeed. Really useful. And even though I show uh, Maven as the tool for this, I want to repeat that this little bit at the end of the line could be anything at all. Uh, shell script, batch file, uh, visual basic uh, automation script, an action script, just anything that can return a zero or a non-zero response. Anything you want. I have heard crazy, crazy things about this even being used on driver hardware driver tests where the box will physically reboot itself and come back around to the same point and continue on compiling, building, and loading the new graphics until it finds the one that causes the compression for the really use this to extraordinary. That was a really fun opportunity for me to show you those things. Um, as a kind of closing thought, I'll just recap that your conversion tools are the ones that we all took a look at the two built-ins, and then obviously just using the back-end conversion. And um, I think all of those make for a great reason that you should at least start exploring this. I can't imagine being without it, but um, nothing is better than being able to end a night like this. Drink up, which is really cool. We can talk about all we want over there. I'll stay for questions. Thank you. Your work is now.